fall 1970. Janis Joplin is the undisputed queen of rock and roll. It's a fact there had been no female superstar of rock before Janis came along. Her rule of thumb was, if it feels good, do it. Famed as rock's wild child, Janis also hides a self-destructive, darker side. She was a very troubled girl and a genius. She could be every bit as tender as she could be hard. The tenderness was real, but the hardness was real too. I think she was looking for some kind of relief to not have to be Janice. Soon, a blast of nearly pure heroin will end her short, dazzling career. This is the last 24 hours in the life of Janice Joplin. October 3rd, 1970, Hollywood, California. For the past month, rock and roll superstar Janis Joplin has been in town working on her latest album, simply entitled Pearl. She's staying at the Landmark Hotel, and it's here, alone, that in less than 24 hours, she will die. It's 1.30 in the afternoon, and Janis is still in her room. Her band is busy laying down tracks at the nearby recording studio, and she'll not be needed there until much later. With time on her hands, she makes a call to City Hall in San Francisco, hoping to get some information about a marriage license. Janice has recently become engaged to Seth Morgan, a man she's only known for a few months. Some of her friends are skeptical about her new relationship, but not her road manager, John Cook. The way Janice talked about her relationship with Seth Morgan was, was very positive. She especially, in, she was describing it in terms of being different from her previous relationships. Janice believes that this time she's found true love. She described their relationship as being different. She said they didn't have to go out boogieing every night. They could read the morning paper together and talk about current affairs. Janice's call to City Hall, however, hits a snag. It's Saturday, and municipal offices are closed. She'll have to try again on Monday. With a whole afternoon ahead of her and nothing much to do, Janice starts to get edgy. She doesn't like to be alone and needs something to help fill the void. Well, recording goes on for weeks, and it's not ever quite as much fun as being on stage because there's no audience there are those boring days, and Janice did not suffer boredom gladly. Janice goes back to the phone. This time she's calling her candy man. He agrees to come by the hotel with a special package, a package that will end her life. A life that just three years earlier had seemed so full of promise. Back on June 16th, 1967, the Summer of Love was in full swing. 50,000 people were assembled for the Monterey International Pop Festival. A little-known San Francisco band of hippies known as Big Brother and the Holding Company was about to hit the stage. Fronting the band was 24-year-old Janis Joplin. People just hadn't heard a white girl sing the blues this way. If you hadn't heard Janice before and she came out and started singing, you were just blown away. Everybody in the band, not just Janice, but Peter had it, Sam had it, James had it, I had it. When we went out, we just, you know, we, we really just went for it. If you had done a whip reverse with some of those movie cameras and shot the audience, you would have seen a lot of people like this.
At Monterey, Janice became an overnight sensation. People were blown away to an extent that I haven't seen a big audience blown away by any artist before or since. And the focus was all on Janice. The phones didn't stop ringing. The press, are you kidding? They went nuts. They all wanted to talk to her. Do you have any explanation why you're so popular? <laughs> Everybody just loved her right off the bat because she was real. She was incredibly real and incredibly open. I just started singing when I was about 17. I listened to a lot of music first, and I, one day I started singing, and I could sing. It was like a, it was a surprise, <laughs> to say the least. She was at the right place at the right time with the right attitude and the right voice. She was this rocker who moved on stage like nobody had ever moved. She was uninhibited, she spoke her mind, and she was an exciting personality. But she put it out there, when she's singing, she let it all hang. That's why her live concerts, people that had seen her just, <gasps> oh my God. Janice's flamboyant style and free spirit struck a powerful note with her audience. Women in particular identified with her. Uh, Janice stood out for a lot of a lot of women's issues, the right to be proud of yourself, period. She was the first person on stage saying that stuff. And people were taken aback by that and also drawn to it. Janice was more than just a singer. She was becoming a voice for her generation. It was a role she was more than happy to play. Janice took to the fame very well. She was up to it for one thing. You know, she was faster funnier and more intelligent by far than most of the people we ran into. At the same time, she felt like, you know, wow, I'm meeting Andy Warhol, or me, this like ugly chick from Texas, this nobody. I'm meeting, you know, these big stars like that. Dick Cavett fell in love with her, which was hard to imagine. It was like a flea falling in love with an elephant. Very nice to see you, my little songbird. <laughs> <laughs> I wore my hip jacket for you, however. You did? Yes, you did. <laughs> are uh, you sure? <laughs> I, thought, I thought I did. Yes, isn't this what all the guys are wearing? <laughs> no, <laughs> not all of them. Not all of them, maybe. But behind the bravado, Janice was lonely and insecure. Insecure about her looks, about her talent, and about her popularity. Drink and drugs helped fill the emptiness. If everyone's drinking, she would drink the most in the room. You know, if everyone's doing drugs, she would do the best drugs and the most drugs of anyone in the room. With Janice's growing fame came a growing addiction, an addiction that would follow her like a dark shadow, all the way to a lonely hotel room in Hollywood. October 3rd, 1970, 3.30 p.m., Rock and roll star Janis Joplin has been holed up at the Landmark Hotel in Hollywood for more than a month while working on her latest record, Pearl. Hours away from being needed in the recording studio, she's bored. To kill time, Janice has arranged for her drug dealer to bring her a fresh supply of heroin. She has no idea that she has made an appointment with death. In less than 10 hours, Janis Joplin, the wild woman of blues, will be dead. Throughout her career, Janice has struggled with an addiction to both alcohol and drugs. To the band, she always presented this very up, very happy, very ready to rock, very ready to play, ready to do the job, make the music. That was the side of her we saw. We didn't really see the other side. And until arriving in LA, neither had Janice. Since April, she steered clear of heroin. She had been clean for six months and proud of it. And she had done it herself because you have to do it for yourself. She decided to get on, get her life back on the rails again. And she made a serious effort to, to stop. But in her hotel room, Janice Joplin takes two steps back. In my experience of the addictive personality, there's always a level of self-confidence that is a step beyond where it should be. So because she had cleaned herself up, well, then she could safely dabble. It's not the first time that Janice has dealt with this particular dealer. 
She uses him because he's reliable, always testing his product. But today, he gets sloppy. Neither the dealer nor Janice is aware that the heroin is uncut and is possibly as much as 50% pure. For even the most hardcore junkie, that level of purity is risky. But for Janice, who has just started using again, it will turn out to be lethal. Instead of getting high right away, Janice decides to call her fiancé, Seth. She has big plans for her and Seth. Lately, they've been talking about her quitting the business and having some kids. She wanted to be more than a rock singer. She wanted to have a family. She wanted to have children. She wanted to get married. You know, she wanted all the things that everybody wants. Family is important to Janice. It always has been. Janice Lynn Joplin was born on January 19th, 1943, in the respectable, conservative, oil-refining town of Port Arthur, Texas. An unlikely birthplace for a woman who would one day be known as the wild woman of blues. When we were growing up, and this is in the 40s and 50s, it was quite idyllic, really, you know, manicured lawns and Little League baseball and sort of a normal, middle-class-looking type town. By all accounts, Janice's early childhood was normal and happy and uneventful, but in her teens, all that changed. Her mother wanted Janice to be what every mother there wanted their daughter to be, and that was popular and have a date for the prom and dress nice and wear her hair right. And it became pretty clear pretty early in high school that uh, Janice wasn't going to follow that road. Plagued with severe acne and an underdeveloped body, the teenager began being shunned by her peers. For Janice, used to being popular, it was devastating. I think Janice probably had a lot of personal problems, uh, self and doubts, self doubts, and as far as her own looks were concerned. Janice dealt with her rejection by rebelling. She dressed in black, swore like a sailor, and thumbed her nose at what she came to see as Port Arthur's hypocritical small town values. And the more she rebelled, the more her peers bullied and isolated her. But Janice did find refuge in the company of a small group of other young outsiders. One of those was Jim Langdon. We all rebelled against the status quo, against the establishment, against the rules and regulations and attitudes that prevailed at that time. Part of their rebellion involved illicit trips across the state line into Louisiana, where they searched for adventure and found the forbidden fruit, black music. And we spent from midnight until dawn just going, prowling in and out of the clubs, the quarters, hearing, hearing blues players, jazz players, you know, just digging the music and, uh, and drinking. She really got turned on to the, especially the blues, blues people, you know. It was just a whole scene that was just magical, you know, really exciting. <laughs> jazz loved it. Yeah, we all enjoyed it, but she really loved it. <laughs> and so I think that was sort of the uh, a, be a beginning as far as the kind of the kind of life that she was going to uh, going to pursue. After one such trip to New Orleans, Janice and her friends crashed their car and were apprehended by the police. It was things like that that solidified Janice's reputation as a bad girl, as a really bad girl she was vilified greatly for this you know she was different and being different was enough to uh, get you a lot of grief she had uh, chosen to fight back by being even more outrageous and more aggressive and they just made matters worse and now in the fall of 1970 deep down janice is still searching for acceptance and love Lonely and bored in her hotel bedroom, she again calls her fiancé, Seth Morgan. They've been living together for a couple of months now, but since she's been in L.A. recording, they've barely seen each other. Janice's friends are suspicious about the latest man in her life. Yeah, the engagement stuff I never believed was really going to happen. Uh, that was uh, strange. This guy, Seth, I don't know. Don't know about him. Janice and Seth begin to argue. He's supposed to fly to L.A. and meet her. They were planning an evening together, but not for the first time. Seth cancels at the last minute. She would be with 
second-rate people if they would love her. You know, that was the admission. Janice slept with both men and women. All was open and unashamed about her sexual preferences. It was a far cry from her straight-laced Bible Belt origins. In 1962, the 19-year-old left her family and hometown behind and headed to Austin to attend art school at the University of Texas. There, she found a like-minded counterculture community of artists, activists, and most importantly, musicians. Musicians like Powell St. John. One evening, uh, we were all sitting around my apartment, and Janice was there with a couple of guitarists, and one of the guys was a big lead belly fan. And Janice started going through all these lead belly tunes that I've never heard in my life. Oh, yeah, that was green corn, green corn. And she's singing this stuff. And I was just sitting there, wow, where did she learn all this? Janice joined the Waller Creek Boys. Janice loved the attention, but not all of it. Every year, the fraternities would uh, sponsor a festival on campus, and one of the activities that they would do, you could nominate a person as ugly man for a fee. So someone nominated Janice, and she won in the voting, and she was absolutely crushed. I think it was one of the only times I ever saw Janice cry. One year later, Janice left Texas and the college jocks who humiliated her and hitchhiked to the promised land, San Francisco. There, she quickly established herself on the local music scene, finding gigs in coffee houses and bars. But something else was also waiting there, a plentiful supply of drugs. In 1965, only two years after arriving on the San Francisco scene, Janice returned to Port Arthur, a speed freak. She came back probably, you know, probably weighing, you know, 87 pounds or 90 pounds or something like that, and needle tracks up and down her arms and, uh, was a total basket case. And she probably realized when, you know, that, that she, she had damn near killed herself. And she was really trying to do everything in her power to do a complete 180 and go as straight as straight could be. But as everyone knows now, her luck didn't hold out. Her first destructive brush with injecting drugs would turn out to be just a taste of what was to come. Now, five years later, in a hotel in Hollywood, California, Janis Joplin's luck is about to run out. October 3rd, 1970, 5.30 p.m. Janis Joplin is leaving the landmark hotel in Hollywood and heading for the nearby Sunset Sound recording studios to begin work with her new group, the Full Tilt Boogie Band. What she doesn't realize is that she's heading for the last recording session of her life. In less than eight hours, Janis Joplin will be dead. When Janis arrives at the studio, her band is already in full swing, working on one of the record's final tracks, a song prophetically called buried alive in the blues. Guitar player John Till remembers. She was really liking the song. I mean, she wouldn't have pursued the song if she hadn't liked it. So uh, it, it was coming together more and more and more, and we almost had it by the end of the night. She really felt good about what was going on, and she told us many times, she says, I just love that. And I said, Thanks, Janice, because we did too. <laughs> so far, recording is going well. Janice, who in the past had mostly difficult experiences in the studio, is hoping her star producer, Paul Rothschild, can bring some of his magic to her new album. Paul was an incredible producer because he could bring it all together. And he felt that Janice had not been captured. And by golly, he was going to do it. <laughs> Paul Rothschild tells Janice he feels the new album is going to be a huge hit, bigger than anything she's ever done before. Professionally, Janice feels she's back in the saddle. Although her rise to fame has been spectacular, it hasn't been an easy ride. 
1966, back again in San Francisco, Janice warmly embraced the hippie culture of Haight-Ashbury. There she met the band that would first take her to the top, Big Brother and The Holding Company. Peter and I were singing, and neither one of us is really a lead vocalist. And uh, Chet says, you know, I, I, our manager, he said, I went to the University of Texas with this woman who sings bluegrass and country. She's an amazing woman, and you got to hear, hear her. And I had this dream that she was this beautiful, gorgeous woman and this great singer, and, and I fell in love with her in the dream. And uh, in comes Chet with this real scraggly-looking girl. And she was kind of tough. She was kind of scrappy. It would be like if you went out and got a cat out in the alley and, you know, dragged the cat in. She's kind of like, she has her claws out, you know. And then when she showed up, she didn't look like anything like <laughs> my dream, but she was beautiful, you know. She was not beautiful in some other way. Janice was a far cry from the sweet-looking singers of the time who were currently topping the charts. But she had something else. When she opened her mouth, I think it was apparent to me anyway, or I think to most of the people, that she was the one, that she was the singer for this band. Janice and Big Brother seemed an ideal match. The band's improvisational jamming perfectly blended with Janice's powerful bluesy vocals. Soon, Big Brother and the Holding Company won the hearts and minds of the San Francisco crowds. My parents had no clue what Janice was doing. You know, the entertainment aspect of it was something my mother was clear about and knew that that could be good. The whole San Francisco scene was a new concept that nobody had really considered before, the hippie thing, the whole bit. Janice coming from the beatnik thing, they were pretty concerned. After she'd come back from San Francisco, pretty strung out and uh, gotten clean and moved back to San Francisco, one of the, f the first letters she wrote back from New San Francisco, with a great deal of trepidation, I bring the news. I'm in San Francisco. When she first came back to San Francisco and joined Big Brother, she had a real aversion to drugs. The first time she was back and she saw someone shooting up, you know, it frightened her so badly that she became hysterical, you know, and she started crying. and ran out of the room and uh, it was very intense for her you know because she just didn't want to go back there again it's like when someone has an addiction let's say to to something they don't even want to see it in the room and then so time went on and probably about the time we moved into lagunitas california she started injecting drugs again for a while, I think she had it under control. Same thing with the drinking. She had it under control, like, like anybody who has that addiction, I'd say, you know, has it seemingly under control for periods of time. And they're, they think sometimes they're doing their best work and they're, you know, and they can't deal without it or that the drug is actually what's helping them to even do their best work. So I think she felt that way about it to a certain extent. For Janice, her return to San Francisco meant a return to a dangerous lifestyle, but it also meant increasing fame with her new band. Equally important to Janice, the band became her new family. Together they lived, played and partied. But after her stunning performance at Monterey, Janice's surrogate family began to slowly turn dysfunctional, something drummer David Getz will never forget from Monterey on was the, really the beginning where it really separated Janice from the band. It made her a star, it made her a diva, a, 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 an icon. It started out Big Brother and the Holding Company on the poster and then it said Big Brother and the Holding Company featuring Janice Joplin, real small letters down at the bottom, you know. And then the Janis Joplin got larger. Then it became Janis Joplin, Big Brother and the Holding Company in the small letters down to the bottom. And if you ask me to read her mind and say when she came down the street or we drove down the street and approached a gig and she saw Janis Joplin in big letters on the marquee, I'm sure that her heart beat faster. How can it not? The press loved Janis, but not the boys in the band. They considered Big Brother to be mediocre musicians, not worthy of backing the stellar Janis Joplin. And things only got worse when the band began recording their first album. We'd never been in the studio 
before. We didn't really know how to record in a really, um, in a kind of sterile, um, controlled situation like that. Yeah, we try like, you know, a certain number of takes, and if we don't get it by then, let's like, say we don't get it by 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, we can spend a few hours doing something else, you know? How's that? I think we ought to just run over some of these things, so instrumentally, and then listen to them and see what could be changed. Uh, what know, are you going to hear when you hear that, Sam? You're going to hear the vocal. I mean, you aren't saying, well, is the rhythm guitar right? I mean, you aren't even aware of it, because what you hear is what's fr up front. Yeah, yeah. And when we play Peace of My Heart, what's going to be up front is going to be the vocal. Suddenly you're making a recording, and it's about like every little sound, whether it fits. Is this the right note? Is this the right beat? Does it fit together? Is this off from that? So all of a sudden there was, you know, uh, seeing ourselves as, as inadequate. And that's when Janice may have had started having, you know, even more second thoughts about the band. By the end of 1968, buying into what the press was saying and hungry for yet more fame and attention, Janice announced that she was leaving the band. She loved these guys. But the alternative that's being offered is, do you want to go out on that stage as the act? How can she possibly say no? After making the breakup public, Janice and Big Brother still had to play the few remaining gigs on their tour. There was definitely a lot of tension between the people in the band and Janice because everybody knew the announcement had been made that she was leaving the band. The audience knew it. And in some way, the band, we, you know, we felt really less than. We felt really vulnerable. Peter got into a fight with her on stage. After one of the songs, Janice was panting into the microphone. She was going... <sighs> So Peter Albin, our bass player, says, welcome to the Lassie show, folks. She took it to mean, like, you're a dog, you know, calling her a dog. And she said something like, just you, man, you know, again, like, she, she snarled at him. And then the same thing, back, you know, after the set, backstage, they just were screaming at each other. They may have even hit each other, I don't know, but it was, it was just really, it was a terrible scene, you know. For Janice and Big Brother, it was the end. She had turned her back on her new family, one that had loved and accepted her for who she really was. It was a decision that would haunt her and eventually lead her down a self-destructive path that, in less than three hours, will finally reach a dead end. October 3rd, 1970. Sunset Sound Recording Studios in Hollywood, California. Janis Joplin is busy working on a track for her latest album, Pearl, with her new band. She tells producer Paul Rothschild how much she's looking forward to recording the vocals the following day. But Janis will never get the chance. In less than three hours, she'll be dead. Excited by the positive vibe in the studio, Janis decides to share her good mood with her fiancé, Seth Morgan. She calls her home in San Francisco, where he's been staying. But the man she plans on marrying isn't there. Instead, she speaks to her roommate, who tells her that Seth has gone out for the evening. Feeling abandoned, Janice reaches for one of the few constants in her life, the bottle. There might have been a Mickey there of, uh, of Southern Comfort. I, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't spend too much time in the studio control room myself, but uh, I, I might have heard some glasses tinkling. Medicating in times of crisis is something Janice has been doing most of her life. But it wasn't until 1969, soon after leaving Big Brother and the holding company, that her bad habits turned into life-threatening addictions. After Big Brother, Janice formed the Cosmic Blues Band, a group of hand-picked professional musicians. But almost from the start, things did not go as planned. Janice kind of not sold out, but she wanted to, to make this a business venture. At some point, it became more than just 
it became everything for her. She left this family of Big Brother and the Holding Company and went into this new organization, but she didn't know how to lead the organization. She forgot about that part. She didn't know how to put a band together. She liked the idea of having a horn section. The new band had a horn section. She really wanted to try to emulate that whole thing, so she was a real departure. And for the people who had accepted her as part of an, as the great vocalist with an acid rock band from San Francisco, this was a big change. And it took a long time to win people over. Going from Big Brother and the Holding Company into Cosmic Blues was another cold bath because Big Brother was a family and we just thought we were gonna stick together always. And so she left and I became an employee of hers. They're all looking to Janice as the band leader, and she didn't even know she was supposed to be that, let alone how to do it. She changed personnel constantly, so everyone's real insecure about their job. You know, I think we had five drummers or so. And, you know, changed horn players many times, had two or three keyboard players. So she's changing everything compulsively in the band so no one could relax, you know, we couldn't gel into it. Janice wrote a song called I Got Them Old Cosmic Blues Again Mama, and we named the band the Cosmic Blues Band from that song title. Um, from the beginning, there was a problem because the press and the audience had accepted Janice with Big Brother, especially strongly on, in San Francisco and the West Coast, there was a feeling that she had abandoned Big Brother and had used them as a stepping stone, and there was a lot of hostility, and it was very difficult to overcome. <laughs> Furthermore, the new soul sound of her band did not go over well with her audience, or the critics. The minute she left Big Brother, they said, she should go back to Big Brother if they all have her, you know? And she just cried and cried about that, almost like all night. Accustomed to being the darling of the media, Janice is crushed by the bad press. She was devastated. You see, you'd gotten all this agitation. She was ambitious. Janice wanted to be a big star. Things that were said in the press, you know, j just devastate her, where, where they wouldn't bother, you know, say, Jimi Hendrix or somebody. You know, She didn't have the reserves to do that. So when all of this comes out, she went back to her hotel room and dead up, I'm sorry to say. As well as numbing herself with heroin and booze, Janice played up even more to her reputation as the wild woman of rock both on and off the stage. What was on stage was part of Janice. Lots of people thought that was all there was. And then you see her as the little girl who is easily hurt and uh, sometimes cries easily and, and uh, feels a great, at the same time, a great sense of injustice if she was treated wrongly, badly by somebody and could make me just feel terrible because if I screamed at the gutsy Janice and then all of a sudden she turned into the little girl who was hurt, I just felt awful. There was this complex personality, and it was Janice. And the only part we really wanted to get rid of was the addict. She was addicted to speed first, and then, you know, then alcohol, and ultimately heroin and alcohol. I began to notice she was drinking more beforehand, and it was affecting her performances, and she was using heroin more. Uh, she always used to save these things for after the performance, because then it's like a reward. Does it go from that to becoming something that, something else, to where you just need it to feel okay? And if you don't have it, you feel oh, just so, so bad, like you want to kill yourself. I said, Janice, you have to take it, take it easy, take it a little bit easy. And she's sitting on a bed, we're in a motel room, and she's going, I'm not going to die. My ancestors were pioneers. They came across the whole United States in a covered wagon. They were tough people, and I have their genes, and, you know, nothing's going to happen to me, she says. And I said, don't say that. Janice's drug use began to spiral out of control. In March of 1969, her friend, Linda Gravenitis, found her passed out, her face gone purple. Janice had OD'd, and it would not be the last time. You cannot make someone with an addictive personality do anything. You can't do it for them. You can tell them how you feel, and I did tell her how I felt, you know. I said, I don't like to see you like this. At Woodstock, in the summer of 1969, 
Janis Joplin could no longer hide the effects of non-stop touring and binging on drugs and alcohol. She was feeling down. She physically was not in good condition. Um, and she was very uncertain about her future. At the end of 1969, Janis disbanded the Cosmic Blues Band. It had been a disaster. She had given up her musical family, Big Brother and The Holding Company, for a bigger shot at fame. And all she had to show for it was a nasty addiction to booze and smack. An addiction that would eventually take its toll here in Hollywood, California. With recording of the new track done for the day, Janice and some of her bandmates stop at the local bar, Barney's Beanery, for a nightcap. Here, Janice Joplin will raise a glass for one last time. In less than an hour, a lifetime of excess will finally catch up with the queen of rock and roll. October 4th, 1970, 12.30 a.m. Barney's Beanery, Hollywood, California. Janis Joplin is enjoying what will be the last drink of her tumultuous life. In less than one hour, she'll be dead. Janice and her bandmates from the Full Tilt Boogie Band are unwinding at the local bar after a day of working on their new album, Pearl. Ken told me that uh, she was really happy with the way things were coming along. She says, don't you guys ever leave me. I said, don't worry, we won't. In Janice's latest band, she's found a great group of musicians, a new family, and most importantly, a way to get back into the spotlight. In 1970, after the breakup of the Cosmic Blues Band, Janice decided to get clean and get herself a new band. They called themselves the Full Tilt Boogie Band. What I saw in Janice the minute we went out on the road with Full Tilt Boogie was a changed woman. And in the way that I really didn't expect was that she had figured out how to be the band leader. And from before we even hit the road, they all came together as personalities. They were a band. It wasn't Janice and the Full Tilt Boogie Band. She was a member of the Full Tilt Boogie Band, and she liked it that way. Janice's performances that summer were, they made you think of Monterey, they made me think of, of the best evenings with Big Brother, because they were Janice at her best, but they're pretty much that way every night, because she felt so positive about the band. The most fun we had uh, in the summer of 1970 was going up to Canada and uh, being part of Festival Express. Festival Express was a tour across Canada by train involving the cream of Canadian and American rock and roll. Are we in Calgary already? Everybody said... <laughs> it was like Woodstock on wheels. We had a great deal of fun pretty much from the start. But the train was special because we were with all these other musicians, and of course she knew the dead. It just went from one thing to another. <laughs> all through the summer of 1970, Janis Joplin was back at the top of her game. Once again, she was the toast of the town. And in June, feeling confident that her demons were finally behind her, she made a surprising announcement to her favorite TV host, Dick Cavett. You ever get back to Port Arthur, Texas? No, but I'm going back next in August, man. I guess what I'm doing. I don't know. Net I'm going to net? my 10th annual high school reunion. Oh. Do you think you'll have a lot to say to your old high school classmates? I'm going to laugh a lot, man. <laughs> Were you not uh, surrounded by friends in high school? They laughed me out of class, out of town, and out of the state. Mm. So I'm going home. <laughs> oh, I thought it was hilarious. I loved it. I mean, that was Janice. You know, that was, uh, I mean, uh, the timing, everything was just, just perfect. She wanted to go home with all her finery and her reputation and her well-earned fame and strut for Port Arthur. Well, she wanted to rub their faces in it, I think. She was like, I'm going to go back and show those guys and really make them upset. Janice longed to be accepted by her hometown. Instead, she found herself again taking on the role of unwelcome outsider. Even her family gave her a chilly reception. Her brother Michael recalls. 
my parents treated her pretty cold, and uh, they were pretty upset with the way she'd been talking about them and the town. So that was a real tense situation around the house. And some of the cold reception she'd received from her friends, uh, it really put a change of perspective in her. And it didn't really work out for her, you know, because I guess they still didn't, uh, didn't accept her. News crews were around and all that kind of stuff. There's a great interview that she was doing at the reunion. They were asking her all these questions. And you can really see her start to retreat from that, I want to rub it in your face stuff. And she became really vulnerable. Like, maybe this wasn't a great idea to come be a jerk. Chastened, Janice returned to the West Coast. In the early fall, she began working on her new album, Pearl. As usual, when visiting L.A., she booked herself into the Landmark Hotel. In less than 30 minutes, her final stay here will be over. Returning from Barney's Beanery, Janice bids goodnight to her band and returns to her room alone. She reaches for the heroin she bought earlier that day and prepares to inject it. After fixing, in what will be her final act, Janice leaves her room and walks to the front desk of the lobby, looking for change for the cigarette machine. As she makes small talk with the night manager, the man has no idea that he will be the last person to see Janice Joplin alive. Janice buys a pack of Marlborough cigarettes, returns to room 105, and starts to undress. Suddenly, she pitches forward as a blast of nearly pure heroin shoots to her brain and knocks her to the ground. It's October 4th, 1970, 1.30 a.m. Janice Joplin has just injected a rogue batch of heroin, which has stopped her heart. For the next 18 hours, she lies undiscovered, wedged between her bed and a side table. When she doesn't show up at the recording studio the following day, her producer, Paul Rothschild, phones her manager, John Cook. Paul called me at the motel and said, Janice was supposed to be here an hour ago, and she's not here, and she's always on time. So I went to the desk, and I got the key. went to the room and there was Janice, except that Janice wasn't there. I put a finger on flesh and the spirit was long gone and there was no question. Janice was dead on the floor of her motel room. Her death is estimated at 1.30 a.m. on October 4th, 1970. Her autopsy confirms that she died of a massive drug overdose. Generally, heroin on the street is hugely diluted and less than 3% pure. When tested, it was found that what Janice had in her system was 40 to 50% pure. There was a story on the 10 o'clock news. Still gets me. Still gets me. That same weekend in LA, eight other people die of an overdose of almost pure heroin. Janis Joplin's album, Pearl, is released four months later and becomes her best-selling and most critically acclaimed record. It's, it's just too dangerous to play around with that stuff. And, and most people I know that did aren't with us anymore because it can kill you in a snap. It was inevitable and really surprising, both at the same time. When she died of a heroin overdose, it was really hard, because I didn't have a role model anymore. Nobody was surprised. I wasn't surprised at her death. But one of the most truly surprising, surprising things about Janice's life and death is that she's still with us. Is that 37 years later, no matter where you are in America, you can flip on your car radio 
And at some point or another, you're going to hear Janis Joplin singing. Janis was like a race car driver, you know. They win races, they get great adulation from the fans, but there's always the chance that they'll wipe out. I had a dream where Janice was on stage, and it was the end of the set, the end of the encore. And that was maybe a month or so after she died, and I felt like it was Janice coming to say goodbye. And Janice came down the ramp, and, and there was this little girl needing uh, approval and, and comfort. And she said, was it okay? Was I okay? And I said, you were great. <laughs> <laughs> 